Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. Thank you for taking time to be a part of this online and virtual study. It is an honor to get to learn and grow together with you. I want to encourage you to participate tonight. You feel free to make comments. You feel free to use those uh, emoji buttons. Uh, you feel free to message us. You, you feel free to share this. If this blesses you and you think it'll help someone else, we would be honored if you would pass this on to other people. We're going to be sharing together tonight about the healing power of reconciliation. And we're going to be looking in both 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, and eventually in Matthew uh, chapter 5 and chapter 18. So the main text again will be 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But before we get into the lesson and into the scripture and all that kind of good stuff, we want to take a few moments to pray together. While we are praying, we want to continue to lift before the Lord those who are battling COVID. We got word that uh, Bucky and Sandy Trail are battling COVID. We want to very much be praying for them. We also got word that I believe Bucky's sister passed away due to COVID. We want to be praying for that family. We want to remember the family of Beverly Harless. Uh, this was uh, Bill Harless's aunt who passed away. We want to remember them in prayer this evening. We also got a prayer request, <coughs> excuse me, for um, a friend of mine, uh, her mother, Shirley Scott, is not doing well, and we want to remember Shirley Scott and her family this evening. Perhaps there are other requests that you want us to be aware of. Please feel free to put those in the comments or send them to us in a direct message. Uh, while we may not reiterate all of those requests in times like this, I can assure you we do pray for those requests. We do very much want to be praying with you and for you about the needs that are on your heart. Let's take time and pray together this evening. Lord, thank you again so very much for the opportunity to get together to study your word. I thank you, Lord, that um, we can use this platform to do things such as this. And we just pray, Father, that you would guide and direct and bless our time together. We ask, Lord, tonight that you would be with the various requests that are represented in this time. We pray for Shirley Scott and ask that you would have mercy on her. Uh, pray for Sherry and for their family. Lord, comfort and keep them through this time. We ask, Father, that you would be with Bucky and his wife as they battle COVID. We ask that you would intervene and make them whole, well, and complete. And Lord, comfort them as they mourn the loss of his sister. We pray, Father, for the Harless family. Lord, be near them and comfort them through this time of loss, we pray. We ask, Father, for the various other requests that are being messaged in uh, and those that are unspoken. We pray, Father, you would have your perfect will and way in each one. We thank you, Lord, again for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you that we get to study your word. And we pray, Father, that you would enlighten us and that you would help us tonight as we look together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for agreeing in prayer with me tonight. Uh, this evening, we're going to be looking in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 21, to start out. And again, we're talking about the healing power of reconciliation. Now, um, a week ago in this particular series is when this last one was shared. We talked about uh, healing from hurt. And we, we discussed in that lesson how we get hurt by people and we hurt other people. It's just... It's kind of a part of life. It's not that any of us want to live our lives each day thinking, how can I go hurt somebody? That's not our goal. At least I hope it's not your goal. Um, but even with that, we do get hurt and we often hurt other people. And when there's a rift in relationships, how do we reconcile? How do we mend those broken fences? Well, to do that means to reconcile. And we're going to talk tonight about uh, just what that entails. So uh, let's look first from a, uh, the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 17. Uh, this idea of reconciliation really is God's idea, and he's made it possible for it to happen. So 2 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul, writing to the Corinthian believers, is explaining in these few verses how Jesus Christ makes it possible for you and for me to be reconciled to God himself. That's the only way it's possible. Jesus paid the price for your sins and for mine, and because of his shed blood, we can come back into right relationship with our creator. That is what reconciliation is. If you want a, a definition of it, it, we would say to restore to friendship or harmony. And, and Christ did that for us. He made it possible, we who were sinners, we who deserve the penalty of our sin, we who were far from God and we were living in enmity, if you will, with God, through Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to the Father. Now, we're to believe, we're to repent, we're to do each of those things that are good and right and appropriate to do in order for that reconciliation to take place uh, on our part um, with God through Christ. But it is Jesus who did this. He's the one who's made it possible. And Paul tells the Corinthian believers that he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, first and foremost, that is because we've been reconciled to God, we're to go and share the gospel with other people so that lost sinners might be reconciled to God just like we have been. But this idea of reconciliation can occur between uh, people who have rifts in their relationship as well. The same grace that reconciles sinners to the Father can reconcile broken friendships and family rifts. I believe that with all of my heart. Now, just real quick, let me ask you. Have you ever had any broken relationships in your life? Um, maybe it's a friendship that dissolved over some issue. Maybe it's family that you got in a fuss over and things just aren't the same. Maybe um, it was a breakup with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Maybe it was a divorce. Um, it could be a multitude of relationships where the enemies come in and there's been disharmony, there's been disunity, there's been a breakup, if you will. So tonight we're going to talk about what does it take then to try to restore that or to reconcile that. And we're going to use the word reconcile as an acronym this evening. So follow along with me. It begins, if reconciliation is going to take place, you, you have to begin with the recognition of an offense. you got to recognize there's a problem, all right? Now, some folks go through life letting every little thing offend them. We talked a little bit about that last time. Uh, we don't want to be so thin-skinned that um, we let anything and everything offend us. But um, by the same token, we do need to understand that there are things that happen um, and they, they are hurtful. They cause harm to a relationship. And going through life believing that you are completely unoffendable and nothing can really bother you when down deep there are things that are bothering you, well, that's, that's living in denial, and that is not healthy or good. The truth is we all get offended over something at some time, and it is, it's unhealthy to deny that, as we said. Um, and it's also unhealthy to think that we're going to go through life and never offend somebody else or cause pain uh, in their lives as well. Whether intentionally or unintentionally, we hurt people and we get hurt by them. And let me let you in on a little secret. That can even happen in the church. Um, someone has come up with this little quip, and uh, I believe it makes sense. They said it this way. To dwell there above with the saints that we love, that's going to be glory. But to dwell here below with the saints that we know, well, that's another story, okay? Sometimes even in congregational life, we can come up against uh, a situation or uh, a disunity situation. Something happens, we get offended, and there's a rift in the relationship. You have to recognize the offense before you can reconcile it. If you pretend it didn't happen, 
it's not going to get reconciled, okay? Now, the next step in reconciliation is an evaluation of the pain. When you realize you've been offended or there's a rift between you and some other person, you need to evaluate the pain that's been caused. And you need to give a fair evaluation of that. Now, there can be a tendency for the person who's been hurt to overemphasize the pain. There can also be the tendency for the one who's done the wrong to minimize the pain. We need to find the fair balance in there to, to truly evaluate and assess how big of a rift <clears throat> excuse me, is this. Let me give you an example. Some, some pain, some offenses are a 50 cent offense. Others might be a $50 offense. Let me explain it this way. Some years ago, while I was directing fourth and fifth grade camp in Louisiana, I walked into the tabernacle, the back part of the big tabernacle down there, and I was approaching some of the other directors, and there was a camper um, standing there, and I was approaching them from the back. And, and as I walked up, just as I walked up, that camper spun around and hit me right in the gut. And I got to tell you, that kind of knocked the wind out of me. And as soon as that camper looked and saw, oh, I just hit one of the directors and I didn't mean to. That camper was about to crawl under a pew because that camper thought they were going to get in really big trouble. And I just want to tell you something. That girl could hit, okay? <laughs> now, here's the deal. She didn't mean to hit me. It was a total accident. It was a 50-cent offense, all right? Now, it hurt a little more than 50 cents, but it was a 50-cent offense, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, she didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. I looked at her, assured her that she was not going to have to do push-ups or clean toilets for hitting a director accidentally. <laughs> she felt bad. She apologized. We went on. I got over the pain in my gut. You know, hey, we're all good. That was a 50-cent offense. You've had some 50-cent offenses in your life. You've probably also had some $50 offenses. Years ago, um, when I was still growing up and living in Welch, a friend of mine hollered at me one day. And he seemed a little angry, but I just kind of, you know, blew it off and walked down to see what he wanted. Next thing I know, this dude is pushing me and punched me, he accused me of something that I hadn't done. And he punched me in the eye and blacked my eye. That was a $50 offense. That guy intentionally wanted to cause harm. And uh, the good news is to just kind of get to the end of that story. While it took time, I eventually forgave him and we, you know, became friends again. But it took longer for me to kind of deal with that situation than it did with a camper who accidentally hit me. You have to evaluate the pain. Is this a 50 cent offense or a $50 offense going on in your life? Or somewhere in between. And please be careful to evaluate it with a fair market value, if you know what I mean. If every offense coming your way is a $50 offense, well, we might need to have a different conversation, all right? Now, I'm not trying to minimize your pain, but you, you just need to give an honest evaluation of the pain and, and be able to move forward from there. So you start, we start with the recognition of an offense, then we need to evaluate the pain. The next thing that needs to happen if we're gonna reconcile there's got to be a confession of wrong. If you have wronged someone, confess it. Own your mistake. Own your offense. Own up to your sin, if you will. That's what is involved. Uh, Proverbs 28, 13 says this. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Okay, uh, when you are wrong, own up to it. And pride, by the way, is the chief enemy to this whole reconciliation process. Um, if you have been wrong, confess it. Now, you don't have to confess to anything that you're not wrong about, but you should confess to that which you are wrong about. I had a buddy in Louisiana told me one time growing up that 
him and his sister and his brother, you know, when something was, had some, one of them had done something wrong, their mom would get on to them and just get on to them until one of them finally confessed. And the two brothers one time ganged up on the little sister and started uh, just saying, you know you did this, you know you did this, and she hadn't done a thing wrong. But uh, mom coerced a confession out of her and the brothers didn't help any. Well, that's not true confession of wrong, okay? Um, those guys needed to confess later and they did. But if, when you are wrong, confess to it. Uh, that is necessary in order for reconciliation to take place. You gotta recognize there's been an offense, evaluate the pain, confess any wrongdoing, and, and in confessing your wrongdoing, you also need to offer a genuine apology. Three of the prettiest words that you can ever give someone else that you have wronged is, I am sorry, okay? These are some words that maybe you realize you need to tell somebody tonight. Um, you've wronged someone. You've recognized the offense. You've evaluated it. Uh, you're, you, you've kind of owned, you're, you're realizing, oh, man, I, contrib I contributed to this. I was wrong in doing this. And you're feeling healthy and true guilt about that. And in order to reconcile, you need to offer a genuine apology to the person you offended. Now, sometimes this happens and you realize this and the person that you really need to give an apology to has passed away. Well, what do you do in that case? You need to sit down with a third party and kind of talk through some of that. You, obviously, you can't offer an apology to someone who is now in their eternal reward. But um, to, for your own benefit, you may want to process that with a, a neutral third party and just kind of get some of that stuff out. But what about in the cases where the person is still living? In most cases, when you've wronged someone and you, you recognize it, you evaluate it, you, you confess to your wrongdoing and you're ready to offer that apology. If possible, uh, uh, you know, one option is to write a letter to them or to, uh, to call them on the phone. Um, the best possible way, where it's at all possible, is to get with someone face to face so that there's no confusion through the nuances of texting or even, you know, while a phone call would be better than a text message or even a letter, face-to-face um, -face would be best whenever possible. In the overwhelming majority of the cases, I believe you ought to do this face-to-face. -face. And when you do so, offer a genuine apology. Don't try to make excuses. Don't try to blame anybody else. Just say, you know what? I've evaluated this. I've hurt you. And I am sorry for this please forgive me. Now, um, sometimes, you know, those apologies ought to be made privately. In some cases, there may be the need for a public apology, but hear me clearly. No public apology needs to be made until a private one is made first. If you're going to try to reconcile between you and one other person, you make sure you deal with them first before you get them in a setting, in a public setting, and you haven't even uh, talk with them privately, okay? So I just throw that out for whatever it's worth. So you got to recognize there's an offense, evaluate the pain, confess wrong, offer an apology. And then if you're truly going to reconcile, there's got to be a negotiation of the new relationship. Um, where will the relationship go from here? You got to have some honest communication about what happened. And I, you know, if you're the one who's offended the other person and you're the one reaching out trying to reconcile and you realize you've done something wrong and you're making an apology, you're probably trying, you're probably interested in, in getting this relationship restored. Ideally, that's what re true reconciliation is. It's restoring a broken relationship. But you, you've got to negotiate, okay, what, what caused this rift to begin with? And how are we going to fix that? And that, that is negotiation. Now, I want to show you something. Um, when it comes to relationships, I think of them in terms of a cup. If this cup represents, at its fullest point, the, the most rich relationship you can have with another individual, and water being poured into this cup shows the capacity of how great that relationship can be, then 
you and the other person stand on either side of this cup and you have a chance to poke a hole somewhere on your side. Now, in some relationships, the need for reconciliation is so great because the hole's been poked in the bottom, right? And if you pour water in there, what's going to happen? It's all just going to run out and you don't have much of a relationship there at all, right? Well, when you go to reconcile, you patch those holes. But maybe as you discuss this new relationship, the person you're reaching out to for whatever reason, they're, they, they poke their hole right here, but you want it to be all the way up here. Well, what happens if your hole is up here and their hole is down here and you start pouring water in this cup? Well, the water's gonna leak out at the lowest possible level, okay? The point that I'm trying to make is this. Uh, the depth of the new relationship is always set by the low bidder. And that's just something you need to be aware of. And maybe in time, they'll decide to patch that hole and move it up a little bit. And the relationship can get a little bit better. But you decide as well. And if you want it to be up here, and they don't want that same relationship. That'll be hurtful to you, I understand. But you need to respect that, okay? There's got to be a negotiation of the new relationship. The next thing that has to happen as a result of those negotiations is are there some changes of attitudes or actions that need to take place? Something caused this rift between you and this other person. And as you negotiate and talk about what it was that really hurt you or you did that hurt them, um, you got to kind of maybe figure out what are, what are we going to do differently now? What changes of attitude or actions need to take place between us so that we can have that best possible relationship? Uh, I don't know what you found out in dealing with people, but I've learned this. Everybody's got a soft spot, okay? There's something in everyone's life that, you know, maybe they can take a lot of ribbon, a lot of joking, but everybody's got that soft spot where if you try to joke about a certain thing, it's, it's really going to hurt them and offend them more than, an, and, than anything else would. And maybe the cause and the breakdown of this relationship is you hit somebody's soft spot, whether you knew it or not. Um, <laughs> a lot of people with me joke with me about my height or my lack thereof. Folks, that's not a soft spot for me, okay? I've been five foot seven since my senior year of high school, and I'm probably only gonna get shorter from here. If you wanna joke about my height, come on, we'll joke about my height, okay? That's not a soft spot for me. But everybody does have their soft spots. I remember a friend of mine um, down in Louisiana, his soft spot was not his lack of height, but it was his lack of hair. And it really bothered him that he was losing his hair ever so slowly, I guess. And when people messed with him about it, it bothered him. Um, well, if I'm gonna be friends with this guy and I know that it really bothers him about his hair, if I'm really considerate of him and I'm probably, if I want a deep relationship with him, then I probably need to quit messing with him about his hair. That's just a kind thing to do. And if I offended him at some point, let's suppose I made some comment about him losing his hair, and I found out after that 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 really did bother him, and we sat down to reconcile, we would have to discuss the change of the attitude or action. And one or two things are gonna happen. Either he's gonna have to maybe come to terms with the fact that, okay, it's no big deal with maybe that I'm losing my hair and not let it be a soft spot anymore, or I need to recognize that it is a soft spot in that case, and and just avoid that, leave it alone. So the point is, we get to discuss that. Now here's the thing, in this part of reconciliation, it is my responsibility, if I'm the one that's been offended, it's my responsibility to communicate with you what it is that bothers me. And hopefully you have enough about you to hear that out compassionately, and we figure some things out from there. And vice versa, I need to hear you out if you're the one who's coming to me with an offense that I've caused, I need to hear you out and, and go from there. So that comes down to a very um, 
personal thing, and it's our responsibility, depending on our side of the, the problem, to deal with that, all right? So there's gotta be a change of attitude and actions. There also may need to be next, intermission, a time to heal. Um, in Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, we're told there's a time for everything. Um, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace, there's a time for mourning, there's a time for dancing. Um, there's sometimes in a relationship when there's been an offense, maybe you need to take a little break and you need to put a little distance between you and that person while you heal up because this was more than a 50 cent offense that's occurred. It was a $50 offense. And just hear me tonight. It's okay if you need to distance yourself from someone for a time in order to allow yourself to heal up. Sometimes with those $50 offenses, that is necessary. I told you earlier about the guy who dotted my eye. That was a $50 offense. Uh, we didn't make up real quick after that. It took some time. There had to be an intermission in order for healing and reconciliation to take place. Now, let me give a word of caution here. Um, if you're the one who's been hurt in this part of the equation, you might want that, that um, intermission time to go as long as possible. If you're the one that's done the hurting and you realized, oh man, I really blew it here. I'm so sorry and I, I want to reconcile. You want that to be as short as possible. So please just be understanding. If you're the one who caused the pain, give the person some time to heal. If you're the one that's been hurt, take some time to heal. But at some point, hear me, don't milk that for all it's worth, I guess. Give yourself ample time but don't punish the other person necessarily, unnecessarily rather, by writing that time out longer than it needs to be. To those of us who've been hurt, let me tell you from experience, I know this. There comes a time while you do need to process your hurt and let yourself heal or give yourself time to heal, there's also a time where you need to quit rehearsing your hurt and cursing your hurt. You need to let yourself be healed, okay? The next thing we need to do is we need to learn from everything that's happened. It'd be a shame to have a brokenness in a relationship and not learn anything from it. You can learn things about yourself and about others when difficult times come. And if you are wise, through these difficult times, you will truly take some time to learn and get on the other side and be better instead of bitter, okay? So we've recognized the offense, evaluated the pain. We have uh, confessed wrongdoing. We've offered an apology, negotiated the new relationship. We've discussed changes of attitudes and, and behaviors and actions. We've allowed some intermission and time to heal. We're, we're striving to learn from the experience. And the last thing, the letter E in reconcile is this. We need to exonerate our offender. Now, when you exonerate someone, that's just a fancy word for saying you forgive them. You quit holding them responsible for the pain that they've caused you. You do for them what Christ does for us when we genuinely repent. Uh, Christ is ready to forgive, and we receive that forgiveness through repentance and confession. Well, we need to forgive as well. We need to exonerate the person who's offended us. And when we're ready to do that, and we need that really for us, we need to be ready to do that for the individual, honestly, even if they never ask for it. Now, reconciliation really can't take place between you and that other person if they never ask for it. But you need to be ready to give it even if they don't. And then when they do, you can let it go. Now, you may not forget it completely. It may be in your memory banks, but that doesn't mean you have to keep letting it hurt you every time you bring it up. Now, arguably, that takes time, but reconciliation will never really take place unless you exonerate or forgive your offender.
So there it is, several things that take us to reconciliation. Now, here's the deal, though. Most of us don't handle conflict by reconciling. We handle it another way. We recognize an offense. We evaluate our pain. We tally up the score. We let our anger swell. We lose sleep. We internalize our pain. We attack our adversary. We take it out on those around us. And then we excommunicate the offender from our lives. Um, on the short term, that's way more fun. And if you follow that down through, that's not reconcile. That's retaliate, okay? And it, while, while it may feel good in the moment to retaliate, in the long run, it hurts not just them. It hurts you more than them. That is not the way we need to go. Don't go that route. Please don't go that route. Let me give you some closing thoughts on this whole idea of reconciliation. Um, reconciliation between you and God is priority one. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And my friends, if you've not been reconciled to God by putting your faith in Christ, please, for your own soul's sake, do so sooner rather than later. Reconciliation between you and God is priority one. Reconciliation between you and another person must be initiated by you or that other person. Other people can't make this happen for you or that person that you've offended or has offended you. Okay, Jesus was plain about this and clear. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning of verse 23, Jesus said this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. What's Jesus saying there? Hey, you come to the place of worship and God reveals to you as you're trying to worship him. You know what? So-and-so over there, there, there's really a problem. Um, they've got a problem with you. And, you know, you both are my kids here. You need to go talk to them. Now, that necessarily means you got to get up in the middle of church service and go over there and try to straighten it out in front of God and everybody right there in the church service. But you need to reach out to them and say, hey, can we talk? I know that's risky. I know that that, um, I mean, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of guts. But according to Jesus, that's one aspect of trying to reach out and make re reconciliation. And that's the case where you have been the offender. Someone else, you get word through whatever means. Somebody's got a problem with you. There's something you've done that's caused a rift. And you've heard about it, so... Nothing's going to happen unless one of the two of you reaches out. And sometimes you need to be the one. Uh, because even though you didn't call it or you caused the offense, but you may not have even known it. Now, here's the other thing. In Matthew 18, Jesus talks very clearly about where, what we're to do if someone's offended us. And in Matthew 18, 15, he says this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now, Jesus starts there, and then he says, you know, if he won't hear you, take somebody with you. And then if, if that doesn't work, you, wanna, you may want to go to the next step of getting more godly people involved to try to reach reconciliation. But where it starts is this, not with going and talking with everybody else about, do you know what so-and-so did to me? Do you know what so-and-so did to me? No, go to that person. Someone's heard you. They may not even know it. And maybe they do know it, and as you approach them, you're going to find out they do know it. But you're never going to get reconciliation unless you or the other person you've offended initiates trying to make that happen. Okay? I want to leave us with this. Reconciliation is a miracle. Let God help you with this. Now, it is risky. You know, the person that you want to reconcile with, may not want to reconcile completely with you. They may not be ready. You know, they may have their hole poked here and you want it up there. Um, that's not your choice. It may cause you some more pain to find that out, but at least you've done your part. Reconciliation is a miracle. Let God help you to 
through this process. Um, there are a few greater miracles than a restored relationship. And I pray tonight that if there's a broken relationship in your life, that God is speaking to you about that um, you may want to see reconciled. I hope this lesson has helped you. Thank you for your time tonight. God bless you. Have a good night.